Okay, let's do it again. So we're on number 13, <laughs> session 13 uh, of the Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. Um, and we've been going great guns. It's been uh, fantastic so far. Uh, we've had talks and panel discussions now since last Monday. So, um, so we've been going great guns and we've still got the rest of the week to go as well. So just a little bit of an introduction from me, if you don't already know, I think most of you probably do, but um, for the purposes of the recording, my name's Heather Niven um, and I'm your host for today with Maggie, who's underneath um, on my screen anyway, um, who is helping and we've been planning the festival now since before Christmas. So we have um, 59 speaker sessions, I think, or 58 speaker sessions uh, over the course of two weeks, um, all covering everything from theatre through to AI, mixed reality technologies um, and everything in between. And what we've been trying to do is curate sessions with folk that might this one's probably a slightly different because you guys all know each other but most of the sessions have been um from people who have been coming from different areas um different fields um to try and create some interesting conversations in the synapses between areas um within that sort of digital storytelling space uh, but that's okay so i'm really looking forward to our three speakers today uh, we've got a bit of a techie lineup today. We had all women this time yesterday, so it's all men to keep the balance today. Um, and we've got more of a sort of techie vibe um, for our session today. And so I'm going to uh, introduce um, our three speakers for the session today, which is the Metaverse and Digital Storytelling, Empathy and VR. Um, just before I do, though, I'd like to say a thank you to our sponsors, who are the Screen Industries Growth Network, SIGN. So thank you very much to you guys uh, for sponsoring the event, because we couldn't run it without you. So a big shout out to you. So I'm going to um, introduce our speakers today. I'm going to do one at a time, and then they're going to have their 15 minutes of fame. Um, and then I'll introduce the second and third. If Josh has to run, don't panic. He's not escaping. He's just getting a parcel. Um, and then he'll be back. So, uh, so don't panic about that. And then at the end of those three talks, uh, as as we have been in the other sessions, we'll have quite a relaxed Q and A, a bit of a panel discussion, and a wee chat with these guys um, until about one thirty. I've also got an additional uh, speaker today who's called Samantha Kingston. Now Samantha was due to be on the panel today, but um, unfortunately she couldn't make it, so she's pre-recorded her session, uh, and she's looking at VR and empathy around um, alcoholism and how she's used a VR experience to a cope with that experience but also to share it and to to support others and so i'm going to upload that at the end um, of the session today so that will be uh, on the website as an additional piece of content an additional speaker session for today um, but i'll introduce samantha just at the end before the q a just so that you've um you're aware of her background as well okay Right then, so Simon, you're up first. Um, so Simon Benson is a leading technology consultant specialising in immersive and real-time yeah. interactive development. He has close to 30 years of commercial immersive development experience, including military R&D, motorsports and consumer entertainment. Career highlights include leading multi-million dollar AAA game projects, pioneering stereoscopic 3D console gaming and founding the PlayStation VR project. Previously, he was Director of Immersive Technology at Sony and is cited as an inventor of over 50 patents. Wow, that's not bad going. And you've not even got grey hair or anything. <laughs> 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 so over to you, Simon. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'll just put a quick presentation deck up. Hopefully you can all see this. Is that on everyone's screens? Are we yeah. all good? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm Simon Benson. And uh, today I'm going to talk about, obviously, metaverse and things like that. But uh, again, uh, give it a bit of intro and not leave it on a bit of intro to my background again so i run a consultancy specializing in immersive tech uh, as i has already mentioned uh within that i work for an awful lot of different companies businesses things like early stage startups corporations everything so on this list you'll see some businesses there like for example um wristband which is very much a metaverse company doing all sorts of uh amazing things in um the world of uh, digital events and blending digital events with the real world and things like that, which is a really interesting paradigm. But that's very much metaverse stuff. And again, very much got my hand uh, in that space a lot. Uh, things like immersive training, again, um, you know, Blocktopia, which is basically a Web3 metaverse platform underpinned by blockchain. But also I've advised big corporations like uh, Sky and NBC and, and people like that um, on their metaverse strategies. Uh, but equally, I also work in a lot of areas with ecosystem growing. So, for example, Aramco out in Saudi Arabia, Post at Media City in Manchester, where 
we're, we're helping to build the entire ecosystem ready for the metaverse. So making sure we've got all the right skills in place in terms of game engine skills and the creative skills and things like that, which are actually very much tied to, let's say, the world of video games currently, but actually very much ebbing into many other industries currently as well. And ultimately, when it comes to the world of the metaverse that it offers, it's going to be much, much broader than um, than what we might think about our current existing thoughts about where we find immersive experiences and things like that. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we progress. So that's me there in the middle. This was my start of my career again in military R&D, as Heather mentioned. So BAE Systems, I was a simulation engineer. And I think being a simulation engineer has been a great foundation for me. Because again, when we talk about empathy and storytelling and things like that, fundamentally, there we are creating a simulation that people need to believe in order to get that level of engagement. So that foundation for me as a simulation engineer has always helped me in my career, whether it be for industrial applications or the storytelling and, and creative solutions. I then moved on into the world of video games. So again, mainly focused on uh, games which were simulation based initially. So all these, and you probably see behind me, there's gold discs, platinum discs, triple platinum discs, all that kind of stuff for my career of making video games. But not only did I develop these uh, in all sorts of different roles, again, I'm very technical, started as a programmer, but moved into production and executive production and things like that. Um, but I'm also credited on over a hundred other titles, particularly for the, my work around the immersive, supporting them with their immersive uh, elements of their, of their titles as well. And that's because I was one of the founder members of Stereoscopic Gaming on PlayStation 3, which I won one of these fancy Lumiere Awards, which is the equivalent of Oscars for immersive content. I think James Cameron got one for making Avatar, and I've got one more than him at the moment, because I also got one for being one of the founder members of PlayStation Virtual Reality as well. So uh, I've done a lot in terms of specifically focused on immersion. And again, way back in the 90s, I was already working on immersive related stuff. So it's been something that's been a big part of my career all the way through. I do lots of events where I go out and tell people all about immersive tech and things like that. So, you know, it's always been something that I've done a lot of and a lot of networking. So I've, I again interface with lots of people in this field. Again, 50 patents for inventing tech have always been one about rolling my sleeves up and keeping that technical aspect to what I do so I can stay informed. And again, as, as most of you know, that are involved in technology, looking at things like the metaverse on our horizon and things like that. Technology is moving so incredibly quickly that we have to do so much now. You have to run to stand still when it comes to technology because we're just being sort of bombarded by all these amazing new things on the horizon all the time but let's get to the meat of what we are to talk about today so metaverse and digital storytelling and empathy in vr so let's to start this off i really wanted to help define what we mean by the metaverse for a start because this is a term that's thrown around a lot and, and i think you know my view of it is that we won't really call it the metaverse in the future we'll probably just call it the internet uh, just like when the internet was first founded um, people call it the information superhighway and, you know, we don't call it the information superhighway anymore, but it's a good buzzword that helps categorise something that is different to where we are now for a lot of people. So that's, that's my view of what that'll be. And I think the thing I often say when it comes to thinking about what the metaverse is, is to think that, you know, our internet really was designed to replace books and encyclopedias and things like that and it's done a very very good job of that you know but it's very clearly ready to outgrow that I mean, when you think about that origin you think actually you know what the most of the ways that we consume content on the internet is very much like i'd say like reading a magazine in a lot of ways we kind of do it on our own and we kind of flip through pages and it's those pages are nicely illustrated with text and pictures and sometimes videos and things like that but generally that's the majority of our experience but in actual fact, us as human beings, we really want this. You know, we want the shopping mall experience. We want to not sit and read, but we want to peruse and walk through an experience. So we're moving from very much that uh, consumption model of, you know, reading and pictures and things like that to a consumption model, which is much more bound to the way we are as human beings. A social, experiential internet is really what I would say defines what the metaverse is and how our internet will turn into that. And it will turn into there gradually. We're already seeing now that most of our applications run on the internet. You can actually play games on there and stuff like that, stream and stuff like that. So it's it started that transition already and it'll just you know progress with that. There's two factors I'd like to talk about when it comes to this idea of the metaverse or the internet or whatever we want to call it. But one is the Ready Player One paradigm, right? So this is the idea that 
it doesn't matter where I am physically. I can have whatever I want, any fantasy world, any world I'm not really there. I can be anywhere I like, and that's the virtual metaverse, let's call it. So there's that idea, and that's very much like the Ready Player One, and there's lots of things that can do, but I could consume that in lots of different ways. I can be doing that on my computer in front of me right now or in virtual reality or whatever it would be. And then there's another one, which I call the real metaverse, which is the one where we would have it completely immersed in our world. So we might be wearing smart glasses, wandering through the world, and effectively as I traverse the world, I'm effectively doing an internet search, if you like, and all the relevant information stored on the internet is being presented to me contextualized against where I am, which is a very different paradigm to the Ready Player One type idea, but you'll see where all this goes in a second and, and, sit and see what you think about this. So the virtual metaverse, is much more about committed sessions. This might be where we feel that we would be consuming our stories. Like when we think about now how we consume stories, you tend to zone out and, you know, like say you're sitting and watching a movie or you're playing a very immersive game or experiencing an immersive experience or something. Traditionally, that's like a committed session. So we do that. We try and get the best equipment that we want to consume that properly to feel ourselves being absorbed into that moment so we can lose ourselves in that moment. So and, and on, in the metaverse term, the virtual metaverse, that's something you can do on a wide variety of devices, you know, whether it be your laptop or your phone or a high end PC or a VR headset or whatever. You could do it potentially on a range of those different things. And you're effectively choosing your level of immersion by the device you want to consume it on. The real metaverse where we're thinking about this smart glasses and things like that is much more casual. It's much more like they say snacking on content. So again, you might play a game while you're on the bus going to work or something like that, floating in the midair and doing all this fancy stuff, but you're doing that out of convenience, not out of being committed. So it's not the same level of immersion, let's say, because it's more casual. And they're the two different paradigms that I think is really worth considering here. And this really does affect the way we can think about opportunities for immersion and emotive engagement with storytelling and things like that. So this is an example of what I refer to as ubiquitous computing in this case. This is, if you were wearing smart glasses, I mean, this is a horrendous video and deliberately done to overdo what these technologies could do. But the reason I always show this, it's the quickest way of getting it across very quickly in a very short period of time that you know, you can see all the opportunity there. Hopefully we'd filter some of this out and not be bombarded by it. But fundamentally, as we're traversing the world, data is coming to us. We're not having to go to the data and we can choose what data we want, what's relevant to us. And, you know, it can all be 3D and interactive and all this kind of stuff. That is the shopping mall version of the Internet, as I would describe it in that regard. So. Would people really do that, though? You know, people say, well, I wouldn't want that. You know, that's never going to be a thing and all the rest of it. And I think. The thing you have to bear, bear in mind is we already have these technologies now. So they've got these devices like Magic Leap One HoloLens that do that already, but they're a bit big and clunky at the moment. The real vision is them to be more like just normal glasses, you know. And when you think about it, our smartphone is kind of the wrong form factor for what we use it for because we're constantly getting it out of our pocket and looking at it when it bings and, you know, constantly having to look at it. Or maybe we get a smartwatch and we're constantly doing that, but it's not big enough to interact with. So we just know that by the nature of necessity, the display has to move to our face really because of the amount of time it interrupts us and all the rest of it. But when you look back at the olden days, you know, cell phones used to look like this and they were massive and the battery would last about half an hour. Uh, pocket PCs used to look like this and do practically nothing useful. And again, didn't last very long. And people were always saying, well, yeah, they're never going to catch on, are they? And, that, and now we have very attractive, desirable smartphones that actually replace both those devices and the battery lasts three days and all sorts of fancy things like that. So, you know, that's what's going to happen with smart glasses. They will evolve to the level where they become a fashion accessory and, and we all love them and use them all the time. And the market will basically be very similar as it is now. So this idea of mass market glasses in the smart in, in that world is the same as our smartphone users. So we will consume digital content on there. We will have story based content on there, but it'll be much more in that casual space typically. But obviously it has a new opportunity because it can be in our space not just in a fantasy world, but you can actually tell stories now much more contextualized to where you are a bit like, you know, when you go to sort of immersive theater or something like that, where it's real people around you as well and real objects around you as well, 
um, to tell stories around. So that's an interesting opportunity there in that regard. There'll always be a high-end immersive space where they can take it to that next level. And that's very similar to people that maybe invest in PCs and consoles now that want that extra level of immersion. And that's where you get more into that session-based stuff where we want to zone out. We really want the stories to you know, to be, be completely connected to us and, and we can seek out that extra level of immersion and that extra level of emotiveness that you can generate because of that. Um, and, and that's a, a niche, but it's a very healthy niche aside of the way you think about smartphones. You know, it's the same now about the number of people that own and invest in home cinemas, big TVs, you know, gaming setups, whatever it might be. Those people be the sort of people that would be going that extra mile for that level of immersion anyway. So there's a big, big niche there, but it's not as mass market as just the glasses. And then finally, there's the super users. Someone will have all the fancy stuff that we see on Ready Player One and all that kind of stuff where, you know, they can put all sorts of fancy suits on. And we already have them now, people that go the extra mile with the game setups where they'll have something that, you know, probably has got divorce written all over it um, when they bring that home and, and install it. So that's a bit of the background into that. But let's the main thing I want to talk about today is really how this could influence digital storytelling going forward. So with that in mind about that technological world that I've just sort of laid out, which is something I'm convinced is, is where everything's going technologically, let's have a think about that. So coming back to this idea of the shopping mall internet, you know, the metaverse as it stands. So a few things here that are really going to resonate when it comes into the opportunity for storytelling is typically this will be multi-user by default you know our landing point on our internet will naturally already have our community with us um, when we start so as a result we'll probably be a better position to take that forward a bit like when you sort of log into steam or something to play a game and you've got your friends list there and you know who else is online and that might dictate your next step and say well actually i'm going to go and play this with you then or whatever it might be but we've got this multi-user by default thing so that means that Fundamentally, our stories are much more likely to be more group based, socially based and things like that and, and accommodate multiple users in a, in a way and, and allow it to sort of naturally work with their different uh, experiences and all that kind of stuff. So that, I think that's definitely going to be a, a key there. Platform level integration expectations. So what I mean by that is because when we land on our Internet starting point, let's say it'll have a lot of things already, it'll probably have avatar customization and clothing and friends lists and chat and voice chat and all these other things already. So they'll just come with us that we will have, you know, parameters defined already. So they'll come in whatever digital story we're going to have, we'll probably already have those things, which means we have to think about this, what my avatar is, what, what my persona is as well in terms of that regard, because you know, if I've already got the ability to wear whatever I want and all the rest of it, then it'll be the case where a lot of these digital stories will tell now consider embracing that and saying, well, can I allow people to come into this story that I want to tell effectively as them digitally and not where we are now, where traditionally we get you to embody another character in our digital storytelling and tell a story with you included in that as an entity that's very much bound to that world, I think there's going to be much more scope to say, what if we take that out of the equation as well and tell stories where actually you could be whatever you want to be. You could be you, you could be how you represent yourself. And also your social group could be how they represent themselves and how you all behave together. And I think that's an interesting challenge, taking it from the fact that when we're telling stories, if we always have a lot of control when we can basically dictate the behavior of your individual character that you embody. So for example, if I play Indiana Jones, you know, my character will be afraid of snakes, but if I'm not afraid of snakes, and then someone puts a snake in front of me, you know, that's the sort of difference that we can have is that the story becomes much more flexible, much more able to evolve and things like that, because everyone has their own persona in there potentially to design to. So I think that's an interesting area for that. The interface itself, when you think about this metaverse that could be a shopping mall like, the first thing that it really means is we're redefining the whole human computer interaction paradigm. So no longer are we having to use keyboards, which were designed to slow down our typing. So the hammers of typewriters didn't lock together. No longer having to use mice, which is an abstract thing, trying to map 2D action on this desk to a 2D action on that screen. 
we don't have to do that anymore. You know, we can have our hands in there. We can have our head in there. If I want to move the camera in my experience, I turn my head, which is very natural. If I want to pick something up, I reach out and grab it. I can talk to the machine, if you like, to the computer, and it knows what I'm saying. All these things that are linked to the way that we can change the paradigm of human computer interaction, again, have a massive benefit when it comes to emotive storytelling and, and, and things like, you know, we truly feel part of that world. They often say you're no longer playing the game, you're living the game. And I think that's what it'll be for storytelling. We'll be living the story, not consuming the story, if you like. Um, it allows for us to be much more bound into that experience because of that human computer interface paradigm. And that paradigm changes because the technology changes. So it's not like where it is now where people have to opt into that because they choose that because they want the extra peripheral, but actually these will be the default peripherals. They'll be the normal way of interacting with computers, uh, this kind of technology. Digital virtual characters as well. So um, this is just a very, it's actually an old video now, even though it looks amazing, of uh, MetaHuman from uh, Unreal. So you can see in this that these are digital characters that look completely believable. You know, they look really human, um, realistic look and things like that. But now in addition to that, we also have AI related behaviors that can look incredibly real as well, that can mimic us. We could, when we put all our emotion into these experiences from our human interaction, you can imagine AI understanding how we all move, how we all behave and allowing us to replicate ourselves as digital entities as well. And there's a lot of AI now that also does personality side of things where when the game designer or the experience designer wants to tell a story, they don't just script the character, they actually psychologically design the character to respond in certain ways and then leave it to you to interact with that. So if you're nice to them, um, then they'll be nice back. But if you aren't nice to them, then maybe they won't be as nice back. And that re can really affect directions through stories and make stories much more of an evolving thing and not necessarily a completely linear track. So that gives us loads more opportunity now to make this whole experience so much more immersive, so much more realistic as well on top. So there are just a few elements. We could talk all day about this, but I won't because I don't want to get on to, to more stuff. But, but I think ultimately everyone has this vision that the Star Trek holodeck is a great reference for where we all want immersive storytelling to go. And I think when you think about that paradigm, there's a lot of really interesting similarities there. Like sometimes if you watch The Next Generation, you see this holodeck thing in action. Sometimes people enter a world in their Star Trek uniform where they look quite out of place almost. And, and that's a little bit like this idea of that platform level where I could take me as a person and say, I want to tell this story about me. You know, I want to be who I am in this story world. But equally, sometimes they all dress up and become part of that. And then they go along with the narrative. And that could also be enforced where it's like, if you want to embed yourself in this world, you've got to conform to these rules. And we already see that in certain massively multiplayer online games where they'll have you know, restrictions on what you can call your character because if it's World of Warcraft and it's very much fantasy, they won't let you call yourself Space Tron, whatever, you know, because they want your name to be more like a fantasy character name that fits that world. So I think that's what we'll see. We'll see this rules of engagement on the entry, to, entry points to certain types of stories to say, if you want to come here, you have to conform um, to these kind of rules to keep that emotive element in play, basically. And I think overall, the future is very bright when it comes to emotive uh, digital storytelling and things like that. All these tools and all this technology I think are going to be very enabling for us and really transform what can be achieved. But I think that's enough about that. I will stop and let other people have a go. But um, but yeah, thanks for listening. And hopefully uh, can we uh, answer you some interesting questions later. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. And I, I remember hearing you talk at the Guild Hall as a part of a Game Republic uh, event. I think you were there as well, Josh, actually. Um, in fact, you might have been there as well, Richard. Were you, all, you might have all been at that event. And I just remember you kind of blew my mind then as well with <laughs> all of this uh, conversation. And just, you know, it's, it's really interesting thinking about the social constructs of multiple people in a space as well and how you know, how you conform to that or not um, as part of this as well, because often with these things, you, you think about it as a solitary activity. And of course, it's not certainly not with um, a lot of the games that are out there now. So really yeah. interesting. And there's a lot of real world references to that when you think about, you know, the sort of experiences you do, like go to an escape room with your mates or you go to one of these immersive things with your mates kind of thing. It's it's very similar, I think, how that will all evolve, you know, that that 
different in paradigm people already already understand you know immersive theater and all these these are already understood things in the real world we're just digitizing them in a lot of ways and that opens up even more opportunities yeah no totally i think you've got massive um communities haven't you maggie because maggie does lots of online gaming and, and i think you know you you've got a huge community all across the world and you know this stuff is probably really relevant for for you in, in terms of the the community that you're in well that's how i met my husband i mean i was living in california and he was living in england and we played wow and we met on wow i did not have the name space tron <laughs> 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 but yeah i mean you definitely i mean I, we've been doing this for years together and i think it's fascinating seeing how it's growing and changing and I'm, that was a real eye-opener for me <laughs> definitely yeah. Blow your mind again excellent <laughs> brilliant well um hopefully the audience are thinking of some great questions for you simon but i'm going to introduce richard next uh, and we'll move uh, we'll move on to the next talk if that's okay so okay. richard is an award-winning creative technologist and developer and the founder of reflex arc reflex arc creates interesting inspirational and educational experiences using immersive technology exploring spatial interactions since 2008 their underlying remit is a simple one to help and enable people through technology. So Richard has produced interactive content across a broad range of platforms and headsets for clients, including the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association, the BBC, David Hockney, the National Science and Media Museum, Marvel, Channel 4, Google, Sky, Universal and Adidas. Other projects have involved the, uh, Disney's The Mandalorian and the Jurassic World VR Expedition. Richard derives tremendous satisfaction from making fully inclusive, visually stunning and immersive products, not to mention playing, learning and sharing. Over to you, Richard. Great. Thanks, Heather. OK, just going to share my screen. Right. OK, can you see that? Great stuff. OK, so, yeah, I'm Richard and I'm going to talk about using immersive content to reach underserved communities, a.k.a. telling stories, sharing lives. So just a, a brief bit about Reflex Arcs, my little company. And yeah, um, I think Heather's already, <laughs> already covered quite a bit. We we make immersive stuff and we particularly enjoy making user-friendly interactive experiences um they're educational inspirational and ideally you know helpful for society so most of our projects revolve around the use of technology to improve people's lives or, or enable them in in some way and as uh, heather touched on we've worked with all sorts of clients from from big to small so I want to consider us as a storytelling company as such but we have used immersive technology to to enable storytellers and artists I've just got a couple of quick examples and I'll come back to those later so one uh, going back to uh, 2021, we were working on the Ant-Man film, Quantumania, that's just been released. And we were using VR to allow the director uh, and, and key creatives to scout the sets and to, to plan uh, shots, just like this one, for the, for the movie. And another way that we've enabled, um, well, in this case, an artist, is using technology, including AR, to help um, this guy, uh, David Hockney, to create some of his, his recent work, such as the, the show that's currently on in, in King's Cross, or some elements of it. So what I want to particularly explore today is the concept of exceptional user design. Um, in this, this case, it's being where a product is first designed for a uh, a particular niche group of users and then it's mainstreamed to other users and then I want to talk about how that concept has helped some of our our commercial projects so I'm a little bit hamstrung and <laughs> some of the stuff I'd like to show you as it's either not been released yet or in the case of Ant-Man um, we, we can't really show much in, in, in you know behind the scenes until it's, it's out on streaming and there are some things that it's just a little bit too early to talk about. So I'm going to sort of talk around a few things without showing a few things. I'll, I'll show what I can. 
So we're going to go back in time, first of all, and just talk about a few projects that we worked on. So this, this was uh, a project that was made um, uh, to recognize sign language. So you actually play it by signing using a, a sign language called Makaton. So any parents out there might be familiar with Makaton uh, from CBeebies because uh, Justin uses it. So this came about through a JISC Tech Disc competition back in 2014. And it was all about uh, it was all about accessibility and and using technology to to enable people. So it's particularly we found it particularly of interest. So we we partnered up with Hassle Inclusion and Game Lab UK, we've worked with for years. Uh, and we created this, uh, once we won it, we created this, sign, this simple sign recognition system to help certain Macton users to, to, to make an easier transition into independent living and, and employment. So the idea of the game is like a sim style game that you actually play by sign language alone. And it was using depth sensors. So in this case, using the, the Microsoft uh, Connect. So moving on um, through Microsoft, whose Connect technology we just used on the, the other project, uh, again in 2014, we, uh, we also worked with the Guide Dogs charity. And this time, it was all about enabling blind children to practice these particular exercises that the, the um, charity, all the charity Blind Children UK, were giving them. And the, the exercises are all about um, becoming comfortable with your body in in space in the space around you, and we were making particular use of three D uh, of a spatial audio technique. So you wear headphones and you can have sounds that, that like travel around you. And we came up with this uh, with these ways of using the exercises as an input to play the game. And you could stand in front of the Connect, and you could play like a, an audio version of uh, Temple Run, for example. So loads of loads of fun fun exercises for that. And thing was, it was made, it made these kind of dry exercises fun for the for the children to 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 play, and so they they practice it and get more involved with it. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of just a great use of the the technology we thought. And as a result, it also won us, or the, the whole team, all, all the partners, the um, Guide Dogs Partner of the Year Award in 2015. So, so pleased were they with the, the results. So that was, that was a lovely project to be involved in. Well, this one, back in 2015, we won an Innovate UK grant to take the body tracking further into the physical rehabilitation space. So we were working with some partners in the NHS and, and adding VR technology to the mix, as well as the skeletal tracking to, to help these patients visualize their treatment and to, to, to measure their progress over time. So again, it was all about motivating them in a, in a really fun and in, in engaging way. So what I wanted to, to talk about is how these accessibility uh, and empathy focused projects could inform some other commercial projects that we were, were working on. So moving forward in time a little bit in 2018, we were honoured to, to get the opportunity to work on this huge location-based experience uh, that took the form of Jurassic World. So it was called Jurassic World VR Expedition. And it would take four, four players through, uh, through the entire Jurassic World islands and they'd meet all of the you know, usual suspects. So there was actually some knowledge transfer that went over to that, that experience from our time working on, on gesture recognition tools. So one of the R&D tasks that we were working on was a way of using gestures to actually uh, gesture to the dinosaurs to, to, to kind of communicate with them. So we were, we were exploring ways they could do, they could, uh, they could 
do the the stance that Chris Pratt pulls in the Jurassic World um, films that that kind of calms blew the velociraptor down. And yeah, quite a, quite a lot of the 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 R and D behind that was based on our time with the uh, with the Kinect technology. So that was great. There was also some work around making the intro and the surrounding onboarding text a lot more accessible for uh, for the uh, participants. And this also made quite a lot of use of HRTF audio. So that's the head track, head, uh, spatial audio through headphones. Uh, so you could hear when dinosaurs were approaching from behind you and so on. And finally, we made a, we put a lot of work into making it, you know, really easy to interact and to not trigger motion sickness uh, by aligning the um, ride mechanics to the uh, to the the visuals of the experience. So moving forward, here back in twenty one, we we were involved in the kind of early parts of, of this film. So this is really the only behind the scenes footage that seems to be in the public realm <laughs> at the moment. So pretty much all I can share. But our part on this was to enable the key creatives to, to meet up in VR. So we'd have a big multi-user session and they'd all meet, um, bearing in mind this was right in the middle of the COVID pandemic and they put on the headsets and they could actually uh, go into these worlds in VR, go anywhere on the sets and plan the shots, uh, plan, plan the uh, visual effects and even plan the, the physical items that would actually be on the set. And then these sets would then be passed on to ILM who would then record them on this stagecraft. Uh, so that's a huge, huge LED screens that they, they film the, the Mandalorian on. So yeah, this, so, so the, the beauty of this was that the immersive technology enabled the film production to carry on at quite a difficult time. But not only that, it's not like you can go film a location like the quantum realm anywhere in the world. So it's just amazing to be able to use this technology to take people in there. And just let them let the creative creative flow, sorry, the creative process flow. Uh, so this this gives you a little bit of insight as to what the the kind of things they were doing. So we wrote some more custom tools in this, and, and none of this footage is actually from that production, but it's but it's the closest thing I've got. Um, so we actually did quite a lot of work on these VR plugins and the in-engine VR um, virtual production system to make it much more accessible. So early on in the project, we were finding that people would you know, get lost in the world, so they'd, they'd make themselves sick. Um, there were certain elements to the, the tools that were quite inaccessible. So we put a lot of work into actually making more more comfortable, um, accessible, and just inclusive for all. So at the whole, so they could just get on with the creative uh, process. Yeah, and the idea being to kind of take the, the emphasis off the technology. But yeah, this gives you an idea of the kind of things that we were seeing in these multi-user uh, sessions and, and Zoom calls. So this is, was an interesting one that we were we were working on last year, which was funded by Exos Stories. Um, now it is still under NDA, so I'm going to have to talk at a very high level about what we did, but some of the things that, that I'm, I'm okay to kind of talk about. But this was heavily, the exceptional user design was, was a central part of it. And it was all about making an experience inclusive, first for blind and visually impaired people, but then for everybody. Um, so to make it, a, you know, truly, truly, immersive and inclusive for all. So the nice thing about this project was it, it really felt like it was a, a, a joining of multiple threads of our journey so far. So these, this is just footage from our initial pitch. So it's it, the, the end result didn't look anything like this, but uh, it seemed um, okay to, to show. So again, we were exploring the use of spatial audio. So you could 
and skeletal tracking so you could play this game uh, purely through audio if you wanted but at the other the other end of the spectrum if for example there's an audio cue behind you and we need need to make it, it, it um, obvious on screen we also had a, a spatial visual captions uh, system so you could indicate where things are coming from or where you needed to turn and it, it, the great thing about this was that even um, it would even used some virtual production assets which it was super cool for me personally as that had been a little bit um, almost frustrating on the Ant-Man project seeing all of these amazing sets that we've made uh, then just being used for filming and then nothing else and we're you know we're the interactive guys so we want to make something interactive with those assets so so the the IP that we eventually ended up working with they'd, they'd just been filming with some some virtual production assets and we got full access to those to, to use so so it's super cool so as I mentioned this this brought back quite a lot of the skills that we'd, um, we'd covered in the previous slides, so anything from skeletal tracking to, to improving the accessibility through immersive technology, through spatial technology, and and yeah, even our, our experience in VR and uh, motion detection technologies came, uh, came in useful and, and at times. So, yeah, we learned a lot from this. <laughs> There's a lot that I, I can't say, but this this is one one that I'm I'm, I'm comfortable sharing. So a key member of our team, Matt, he's uh, he's registered blind. Um, he's our, our sound engineer, and he's a real whiz with 3D audio. And early on in, in the project, uh, the idea was that we'd we'd key things up for Matt, and then I'd give him access to the um, to certain parts of the game engine, and he'd be able to tab through and, uh, and change the values. Now, it transpired uh, during this project that we found out that all the game engines are essentially completely inaccessible to screen reader users, which Matt, Matt's totally dependent on. So we had to actually uh, essentially do paired programming sessions where We'd set up some some software that would allow us all to allow Matt to hear the, the top quality audio directly from the system. Uh, so that's called Sonobus. And uh, then essentially we do paired programming. So we would act as his eyes and he would tell us what sounds to change and what um, what variables to change in them. And another another thing we found during that project is that uh, the immersive hardware itself is often inaccessible. So even if you make an app that's, that, that anybody could use and it's got spatial audio and it's got accessible menus, um, the likes of the Quest, you, you put the Quest on and as a blind user, you wouldn't actually be able to find the app to get to it in the first place. So it's like a massive, um, you know, missing uh, accessibility option uh, across the board as, as, as far as we can tell. And uh, so I think there's a lot of improvements to be to be made there. Uh, we just realised uh, I've been talking for 15 minutes, so I'll probably better wrap up. Um, Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll finish. Uh, I'll finish at this point. But yeah, you get you get the the gist of the kind of projects we've been doing and how um, immersive technology has really helped us in across a whole a whole raft of projects from commercial to um, uh, exceptional user design. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you, Richard. Really insightful, actually, and it's it, it's always interesting to see how. Um, it usually takes being working with somebody day to day who's either got no sight or can't hear properly, or whatever, to really get an, or has accessibility issues to really get to understand the world from their point of view and to be able to either redesign it or work around it or or even just understand it, you know, so it's really insightful that. So thank you for sharing that. Actually, that was really interesting. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, so Josh, you're up next. Did your parcel turn up? Did you get your luggage back? Hey, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it came. Yeah, I uh, had a flight back from San Francisco the other day and they lost my luggage along the way. So <laughs> got that back. Only, only four oh. or five days. Now I know I have to put a washing on. Wash on I was about to say, at least you're now re re reunited with your pants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Always comforting. <laughs> OK, Josh, I'm just going to introduce you briefly. Um, so Josh is a technical evangelist and has spent his career de helping developers succeed on their chosen platform by using a range of tools 
His roles include acting as partner manager, technical producer, uh, UX designer and Unity developer. In 2016, Josh was named as one of Develop's 30 under 30 um, in 2016, previously gaining an honorary mention in 2015. Over to you, Josh. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm over 30 now, so no more of those. Uh, <laughs> press and, uh, oh, yeah, thanks so much, Heather and Maggie. You know, I'm sure many people are going to find have found these first sessions useful and are going to continue to find them. So thanks so much for for having us and, and putting something like this on. I think it's, uh, you know, we were talking just before the session started about how accessible um, this type of content is. You know, I've just got back from, from GDC where you're looking at, you know, anything from $5,000 for the trip and the expenses. So this type of uh you know engagement and um conference digital conference really goes i think a far way to uh to helping a lot of people um see accessible content so that's really great um yeah so as heather as heather said i'm part of the htc vive content and developer relations team so i handle a lot of the partner management around content so acquiring mainly games, but apps as well for the content for our new uh, XR Elite headset, which I'll talk about soon, as well as Viveport, which is a PC VR subscription platform. So I've been uh, in video games the past 10, 11, 10 or 11 years now and focusing on VR and AR since 2016 time, uh, where I was at Unity for a very long time um, and a few other companies. Um, for me, it's always about being as accessible as possible um, with education of you know, digital content and helping people tell their stories and make the content that they want to do. So that's why I've always been at companies that kind of share that mission um, to you know, make as many creators as possible. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, I was at Unity for five years, uh, leading the evangelism team for Europe. Um, very, very focused on VR and AR there, not just in video games, but teaching a lot of uh, B2B companies the value of video game engines. You know, I remember going to places like Arup and Foster and Sons, which are huge uh, architecture companies, and they um, invested into VR very early. You know, the same like Jaguar Land Rover, McLaren Racing, you know, all these companies uh, are seeing kind of the fruits of their labor now because they are, you know, they invested in, in Real and Unity very early. Whereas some other companies, you know, are very against it. Like, oh, what's this game engine technology? What's all this about? We don't, we don't make games. We don't want to be involved with this. But it became very evident that, you know, when VR and AR uh, for mobile or for VR headsets was uh, becoming more and more popular, that the, the skills of video game developers were very much needed in this immersive space as well. I'm sure Simon and Richard can both speak for, for that, about a lot of the, the staff members are from video game backgrounds. And I think a lot of the education establishments now are uh, very much teaching game engine technology, uh, not just for video game students, but for, for more immersive uh, courses, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, obviously I, I moved on there to, to Magic Leap. Uh, mixed reality is is still one of the uh, you know the pathways into the future for me. You know, obviously we've got we've had a lot of VR interest over the years, and people use VR more for video gaming and entertainment. But I think it's a huge stepping stone for how we may live our lives in the future. As, as Simon uh, spoke quite a lot about with with uh, augmented reality glasses and the learnings that we're taking from VR into MR. And now we're seeing the next future of VR headsets having mixed reality pass through, as well as various sensors on them to uh, scan your environments and help with the, the meshing and understanding of your environments. Um, it, it leads a way for designers and developers and anybody really to kind of make use of digital objects, not just in a virtual world, but in your physical world as well. And then I've been part of Vive for the last year or so. Uh, helping bring content over to the platform. Uh, so, you know, Vive, uh, traditionally before HTC, was a mobile phone uh, company um, for, for many, many years. And then in 2016, launched the original um, HTC Vive headset in a partnership with Valve at the time. And we've gone on to make a whole bunch of hardware uh, for PC VR, mobile VR, 
and various accessories such as trackers, PC VR trackers used in virtual production, full body tracking, and the likes of uh, VR chat and many other metaverse um, worlds. And you know this has been a, a great path, and you know we're seeing this very much one of the leaders in the space with the likes of the Vive Pro, Vive Pro 2, with the eye tracking, mouth tracking, as well as mobile VR with the Cosmos uh, Focus 3, with the uh, Vive Flow, which was released just a, a year and a half ago, and much more recently, the XR Elite. This is our most recent device, which is starting to ship recently. It was announced in January at CES. This is a mobile, a device with six degrees of freedom headset, six degrees of freedom with two controllers, hand tracking as inputs, and also with a mixed reality um, color pass through camera and a depth sensor as well, which means that using infrared, we can scan your, the environment and build up a mesh of the world and use our computer vision to do what we call semantic understanding so that we can understand where walls and windows horizontal surfaces like tables and chairs uh, are in your living space, which then can create your physical environment into a, a playing area. So you can have, you know, things flying out of walls. You can have um, digital uh, portals into, into those environments, or you can have, you know, navigation meshes around your environment and that can turn your whole uh, you know, your whole house into a gaming environment, if you wish. And this means as well that every person's uh, environment is dynamic. It means every game, the same game that you play in a different environment is going to be different every single time. So I could be in conservatory area, I could be in my living room, I could be at my friend's house. And every time I play that game, because your environment's different, it means that the game will be different every time, which leads to a really, really um, amazing kind of, uh, opportunities for storytellers and game developers in the future as well. Uh, and then we also just last week announced our self-tracking tracker. Uh, that's not the official name just yet, uh, still TBD. Uh, and this that now allows for body tracking and um, tracking of peripherals, such as you know, a golf club, a baseball bat, whatever it may be, in your environment with mobile VR. So no longer, you don't need a big giant PC, you don't need the base stations anywhere. These are self-tracked in the environment and it means that it's you know much easier, much more accessible to, to do full body tracking or external tracking um, with these devices. And because it's open XR, it will not just work on XR Elite, but the likes of Quest and, and Pico devices, any mobile device in the future, which you know, we're making it more accessible as possible to for players and creators to, to be in the space. Uh, so with the new hardware uh, and these features, it gives us more of an experience to, to create these empathetic scenarios, environments and experiences. So as mentioned, mixed reality, you know, enabling digital content. Because uh, traditionally, right, you'd be in an empty space and you would be transported to a new world, a digital, full digital world. And it kind of gives you this kind of out of body experience because you know you're not there, you know, kind of you're in your living room, but you've got a VR headset on. So you're transported somewhere else. But what if that somewhere else could be transported to your own living space, your own environment? I think that then enables a lot more the user to be more comfortable in that space because they can see maybe a digital avatar they can see a different environment they can see different objects but they still know that they're grounded they're comfortable and they're secure in their home environment we've seen it many times demoing all around the world that when people put on a headset you know it's a very scary time they don't want people to mess with them they're not sure where the walls are even when we've mapped out the area but when they put on a, a mixed reality headset they know where everything is they can see they can still interact with somebody and that's same space, but they can see that digital content as well. And that's one of the main key words is uh, comfortable and confidence. The amount of users that have said, I feel so much more confident in this environment, in this space, because I can still see everything around me. Um, and then using those, you know, those physical boundaries of the walls and the furniture to be part of that experience too. So you can have physics-based 
environments and um, you know you could have a wall a ball bouncing off your table onto the floor you can have particle systems bouncing off your wall around it makes it feel a lot more um kind of lived and, and uh, the experience feels a lot more uh, physical in your space uh, we'll also have a, a face and eye tracking accessory for this device uh, this dramatically increases communication amongst users you know even now right i'm using my my hands to, to communicate, I'm using my eye-to-eye uh, -eye contact, and you can see if something upset me or if something disgusted me in some way, the, your face reaction is a lot less, um, it's, more, it's, it's more involuntary, right? Whereas when I move or when I say something, I'm choosing to say those, but quite often our face reactions are uh, 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 more instant about what we're feeling. So you could then change the environment, you could change uh, anything that's happening in that digital world and dynamically change the interaction based off that user's um, reaction, which I think is fantastic. You know, maybe they're scared, so you can make it less scary. Maybe they're disgusted, so you can change how the the, um, the environment's going. Uh, and as mentioned, you know, full body tracking. You know, there's there's various uh, chats about different metaverse services that don't have legs. And it gives you this outer body experience. Um, you know, it's very hard to um, react cognitively um, in VR right now. I think the amount of emotional empathy is quite great because you're witnessing something in a first person view, but you still know that you're you're just witnessing it in somebody else's eyes. You're not really thinking about how is the user or how is that experience trying to affect me or how am I. Uh, looking at how that user behaves. So what we need to think of is how can we not just give people emotional empathy, but cognitive empathy? And I think full body tracking can really assist with that because you're then transported into a whole new body rather than just seeing it through a first person camera. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do with Viva. So we've been a, a hardware company for a very long time. And now is how we transition to uh, our metaverse or our vision of what the metaverse will be with what we call Viveverse. So this is our built, uh, this is built around our principles of openness, interoperability and safety uh, for online users. And it's not just a place for people to uh, be like in a video game. I think it's such a great, amazing place, an idea as, as Simon suggested about where you can create, you can learn, you can socialize, you can work. And many of the features that we do right now on the internet, you know, you grab your phone, you'll go on Snapchat or Instagram or TikTok, and you'll go on all these social environments and you want to engage with people, people you don't know, people you do know. And I think this, um, you know, the kind of future that we're trying to bring is a way that you can engage and snack on that content throughout the day. It's not just this one hour or two hour session in the evening, like you might do on a video game. It's a way that you can have access to these worlds, have access to your avatars, have access to friends and social networks um, in smaller doses throughout the day. Uh, so right now, Viveverse is a collection of worlds by creators. So it's a web XR uh, focused metaverse. So it means it's accessible on mobile, on PC, on browser, uh, and in headset as well. So we wanna make it as open to everybody as possible. And that's what I mean by this snackable content. You don't have to turn your VR headset on, check if it's charged, put it on, you know, gain, go into that world. You can just grab your phone and go in. You can be on your browser, you can go into meetings, you can pop in and out of worlds. Um, and, you know, we've got many creators creating these awesome worlds as well as IPs and also uh, Vive First for Business. Yeah, and as I mentioned, uh, kind of preempted to this slide, we want to make it as accessible as possible. So WebXR um, is the future in that for us. And, you know, we want to make it so that, you know, we know that VR is going to be the best way to experience, but not everyone has a VR headset on hand when they're traveling, when they're at work. So having it as, as cross-platform as possible to, to engage is, is really important. Uh, and then for us, you know, the hardware is uh, a big chunk, but the software now is... We want to make it more accessible and we want to be able to create the tools so that users can create the stories and the experiences themselves. So, you know, you have various different use cases uh, for the metaverse, for Viveverse, 
Uh, and here's a few of them. You know, you've got your me time. You might have your virtual office, your relaxation or meditation. Now, I find that I personally work best in the evening when I'm not going to get more Slack or Teams notifications or when my team's not online because I want that kind of shut off and I can go into much more focus mode. Or maybe, you know, you want to invite friends to your digital home and show them uh, what your space looks like. You know, I'm in a place in the in the UK where it's not that cultural in terms of exhibitions and arts and concerts. I'm in Hull. Uh, you know, a lot of the time I have to go to Leeds or Sheffield or Manchester or down to London. So having immersive and accessible spaces uh, can you know expand education, can expand culture, uh, and mean that you can experience those with friends all around the world. Uh, and that kind of goes into to social gatherings. You know, I grew up on. On Minecraft, you know, my kid is 12, he plays a lot of Fortnite and Roblox, you know, these type of social spaces to create these worlds and interact with with other people that you may or may not know. Um, you know, we're all used to these kind of Zoom meetings now and, and on Teams and whatever else, you know, some of the most immersive meetings I had was at Magic Leap when we'd jump into spatial uh, in a VR, in a, in the mixed reality headset and have 3D meetings so we could put post-it notes up, we could draw in, in the space. And, you know, we felt like get a lot done and idea creation was a lot better um, with those types of experiences. Uh, so I'm going to leave you on this one. And Richard said something really great, which I've uh, attributed to him. Taking the emphasis away from the technology. You know, we want to enable world builders and storytellers uh, and creators as much as possible. So creating this technology um, for them, you know, to make it as easy as possible. And that's what I feel like every company that I've been at for the last 10 years has, has really tried to enable, you know, Unity has always said about creators and artists, not just programmers, you know, magically it wants to enable mixed reality for everybody uh, and Vive, you know, we want to build the Vive there. So and enable sandbox and world building and storytellers to create their own environments with as much ease uh, as possible. And then for people to experience those um, in, an, in, as, in as most accessible way as possible. So. I think that's where it comes in line with uh, the empathy that we're going to discuss and creating those empathetic experiences is allowing anybody at all to create the stories that they want to tell. Now, I watch more YouTube than anything now because I love the, the stories that people are telling and it feels more personal to me and my interests compared to you know anything that you may see on TV or Netflix or wherever else, uh, which you know they, they are great and vast stories with multi-million dollar budgets, but sometimes I'd much more, rather watch some guy in a tent in the Lake District that's recording himself over a winter night. It just feels more, more personal. So and that's the type of stuff we're trying to create. So looking forward to the discussion coming up and uh, thanks so much for your time. That was brilliant. Thank you, Josh. And uh, again, my, my mind is blown. <laughs> It's just amazing how quickly this stuff's moving on. Even you know your conversation last year, it's you know moved on already since yeah. then. So and uh, the whole vibe verse thing sounds really exciting. I'm an artist as well as a technologist, and so you know just the the possibilities as an artistic person to be engaging with this stuff is is amazing. So yeah, yeah. lots of stuff, sure, lots yeah. to do. Like, um, <laughs> to science and coding, but I want to enable you know as many of the people to create their stories as possible. You don't just have to be a a coder you can uh, you know whatever your medium is you should be able to share that oh, brilliant that's fantastic now um i was going to go into questions um olivia you had a question up but it's disappeared um and i'm not quite sure why in the answer oh, sorry, you know, you've yeah. already answered it that's why <laughs> sorry <laughs> that'll be why you've been jumping the gun <laughs> All right, so we've got a couple from rob from robbie um so simon one for you is the market ready for ar glasses Mm, well, sort of. So I think the biggest question is, is AR glasses technology ready for the market? Um, because I think that's the way around it really is. I mean, what we're going to see is a transition over time because fundamentally VR was massively pushed forward because it just inherited mobile phone technology, if you like. Smartphone displays went straight into the early VR headsets. So they inherited all that and the CPUs and GPUs, the batteries, everything. So really a VR headset of old was basically a smartphone redistributed around our head with a bit of extra plastic and some lenses. Mm -hmm. Now, the AR glasses are a very, very different thing because the display technology is unique to that particular requirement. So it's not had the same momentum behind it that we've seen from other display technologies. Mm -hmm. Plus the idea that 
to for me for a consumer to want to wear smart glasses on the street there's already a precedent set they need to look cool they need to match sunglasses they'll need to last all day you know they'll need to have tiny tiny batteries that last all day there's so many factors so i think what we're going to see first is effectively heads up smartphones so we'll probably get some early glasses that just give us little notifications and things like that light level functionality to start getting us used to the idea of having our information our peripheral vision and things like that but that full vision of you know fully working uh integrated augmented reality mixed reality type consumer glasses mm -hmm. i think we're a good way off yet but i think you know technology as josh has just gone through this where we're at now with that technology is already great and what we'll find is we can use that in our work you know if we're you know techies and stuff like that will probably adopt that because there's lots of extra things it can enable for us but it's all got to get miniaturized and miniaturized and miniaturized and costed down and all the rest of it so there'll be a journey it's got to go on but fundamentally you know i mean vr already shows us how amazing immersive can be and now even with the vr headsets have the see-through vr where you can get the video of the outside world and augment it that's also incredibly enabling and i totally believe you know from what josh was saying it's exactly the right thing that when you have the real world blended with the digital world it's a much better transition so you know sometimes we do training related stuff and and you know what you find is to put the headset on someone and they're currently in the room they were in then you start adding elements for them and eventually take them to a completely you know uh, new world if you like is great but that transition of going through the real world is a really good step so so i definitely think augmented reality glasses we'll start seeing the essence of what we have to be careful of is that we don't listen to what the media say and they'll go someone will put some glasses out and they'll go well they were rubbish because they weren't this sunglasses vision it's like well they're not going to be yet are they you know in reality you might be looking at 10 years for that you know and i keep i've been saying 10 years for the past five years so <laughs> it's a moving 10 years um but is that like a microsoft minute <laughs> exactly that, it's exactly the same thing the bar's been filling up very quickly but it's currently sat there so so yes yeah, so i think time will come um it's definitely in a good trajectory but we have to be a bit patient for that ultimate vision but what we'll see in the meantime are going to be things that give us confidence that there's good value to be had out of there but don't listen to the people that tell you they're giving you that vision right now because the technology is not there and you won't have it right now you'll have something of value but what you'll find is it'll be initially niche and it'll get less and less niche as the technology gets more and more accessible cheaper better faster lighter more fashionable all the rest of it Makes sense. Yeah, I just see it as a, an information viewer to begin with, you know, something the size of this that basically just shows what you've got on your smartwatch, but in a screen, you know, just to, you know, how many times a day do you end up looking at your watch? But you, if you had a viewer and something there, I think that's the most likely mm -hmm. the first step. Mm -hmm. And then some sort of like, you know, obviously we're already seeing well, like the snap spectacles and the, um, the Ray-Bans where you've got a little camera in such capture footage. I think we need that transition too, because I think if someone was to stand up on a stage and go, hey, why? I've, I've, like, wow, I've got this amazing augmented reality class that would do all this stuff, we wouldn't get it because we haven't got the paradigm understanding of what that could be conventionally at a mass market level yet. And I think the idea, you know, as Josh was saying about all these other things that start getting us used to the idea of the value of things in our vision, you know, that will start making us go, well, wouldn't it be great if it did this as well? Wouldn't it be great if it had that as well? And they will come. So I think there has to be a transition. You know, also um, like in social it. settings as well. Like I was at a conference a few years ago, and somebody wore a Hololens for the entire week. Had like huge batteries in his back, and it was still odd. It was at it was a it was at a VR conference. Everyone there was in games or VR, and it was still odd to see someone <laughs> the Hololens. Yeah. On. Yeah. I was once interviewed by someone wearing Google Glass, and you were just paranoid that they were recording you every word. Yeah. You know, but again. I think these social things will definitely relax. I imagine that there's going to be, a, I personally feel there'll be a huge market for buying, you know, conventional glasses that have got tiny Bluetooth cameras in them. Mm -hmm. Because I think when you go to a music festival or something like that and everyone's looking at it through their mobile phone, and you're like, look, if you want to video it, just video it while you can still see it normally. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine wore Google Glass for a, a way over a year and he said the one big takeaway of that was the camera was amazing because you took a photo you didn't have to ever frame it, it just captured everything in front of you where you were looking and he got great pictures of him swinging his kids around in the park by the hands and stuff like that and it's so much more enabling so i imagine we'll start seeing that that people get things like face mounted cameras mm -hmm. then we'll all get used to the fact that you know what okay people walking down the street with effectively a camera on the smartphone point as we don't we've got used to that it's our world mm -hmm. face mounted cameras will become a thing and then that'll also open the door for that social acceptance of people walking around with 
face mounted headsets and things like that. I do remember when I remember when mobile phones came out and I feel an offended when folk would be on their phones on buses, you know, and, and it's just almost like the next day. To, I mean, look back at that now and it just seems daft because everyone's on their phone all the time, you know, so you, no one bats an eyelid. But I do remember when it, folk first started talking on the phones on buses, feeling quite offended by it, you know, so, you know, you're right. People do need that time just to kind of adjust to things and for them to become normal place. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, Richard, you create multi-sensory experiences. What is the next sense? Uh, what what is the next sense you want? You want technology to enable that? Doesn't make sense, Robbie. Um, Does he mean like you know he's done hearing and sight, and now he wants touch? Or okay, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, I think so. is, yeah. So yeah. I think the big one with all the hand tracking and everything is it's. Um, it's it's very weird pushing a button that doesn't exist. Yeah. It's the, you, your your body expects that feedback. So so I think touch is is the big one. Mm -hmm. um, how exactly to to um, to do that in a subtle way is is uh, is the question. Um, and that I I don't know. I mean, obviously there are gloves and ha various haptic things are all at the moment. Well, to my knowledge, huge. So it, again, it's about things getting smaller and you know unobtrusive and um, yeah, more natural feeling. But yeah, that that's definitely the big one because the the hand tracking is amazing. It's just it always falls down the moment that you you reach out to actually touch something. Mm -hmm. I know that um, the Future Fashion Factory over in Leeds, they were working with, I think it was Burberry, and they'd created an ultrasound touchpad thing. So you could, if you were buying, because if you're buying clothes online, you never know what the texture is, the feeling of the clothing. And so these, they were developing these sort of pads that you could put your hand on and it would, sh it would show you the texture using ultrasound. So I don't know whether there's any technology there that you could somehow kind of Nick, <laughs> and yeah, I, to this. I, I yeah. vision how that'll work. I imagine you, yeah. like, say, you can get these screens now effectively that can simulate multiple different textures and things like that. But I imagine they'll be mounted on robot arms in front of us mm -hmm. and search for desk mounted type solutions or local solutions. And again, they can just move them around wherever you want. So they can dynamically give you a touch of whatever, wherever. Um, because they know where your hand is and they know what it's about to make contact with and they can give you a level of resistance. They can say this is very firm, so you can press on it or they can be very squishy or mm -hmm. you can do anything you like with stuff like that. So I think it's very possible and I can definitely see that being a future peripheral that will become part of our mainstay and, and again, won't be that expensive really. It's really simple technology. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's like now. Going, that is more like watches, you know, if you've got a smart watch on, you know, you've got Apple with a potential device this year. You know where the manufacturers can link up and if you've got some sort of capacitive touch where you touch it and it can vibrate to know how much you're pressing into something i think that's the kind of next step mm -hmm. to begin with for for moving forward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so just rather than just tapping you on the wrist it's doing something a bit more exciting yeah. mm -hmm. cool smell's going to be a tricky one i think Actually, smell's already been sold but it's kind of a bit of a it's, weird one i find yeah it is a weird one <laughs> Yeah, because basically what you would often feel, you feel the cold air of it and stuff like that, and that gives you an extra sense. So the big thing I'm always about when it comes to immersion is trying to reduce abstraction and say, if you're trying to immerse me, don't give me something abstract that I have to learn and take as a cue. Because as a simulation engineer, you know, that's what you used to do. You're looking, okay, sometimes it's just giving you a cue is the important bit and their abstraction can be fine because mm -hmm. you learn the cue and that's what you learn to react to. But if you want to simulate and immerse people, you have to be true to reality. And that means trying to avoid abstraction at all costs. So, you know, if you want to do scent and things like that, you know, if you say I can do the smell of smoke, well, smoke's not smell. Smoke chokes you. You know, it's, it's got texture as well. And it's got heat and it's got lots of other factors and you can't do one without the rest. Otherwise, it's an abstraction. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's the thing I always focus on. That's fair enough, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, one from Liz. Uh, Simon, you talk about amplified accessibility and empathy being a characteristic of immersive interfaces, but we see real world biases, barriers and bigotry reflected in digital environments now. So what is stopping this from being amplified by the metaverse? A really good I think the thing that's likely to help there is that we're already aware of all that stuff that's come from traditional channels of social media and the current interaction stuff. So we've got a better foundation to build this on top of. Mm -hmm. Um, because often you find that, you know, half the time these things have come through discovery of when we find how people use these tools we put before them. So at least we have that as a foundation. But I also think one thing the metaverse offers, which is a really interesting opportunity, is the principal embodiment. You know, this has already been well researched, particularly I know UCL have done a lot of work on this. 
but the idea being that if I can embody, um, you know, live somebody else's life effectively, put me in their shoes, mm -hmm. it helps me an awful lot more. You know, if I if I can look down at my body and you know not see me, but but be embodied in some other person from the demographic or whatever it would be and then the world i experience the world in the way they do the empathy that i gain for being put in their shoes and having a moment of their lived experience mm -hmm. is far more significant than if someone just tells me mm -hmm. and i think so i think that's the way we have to look at this is yes there's always a risk with new technology that will find new problems fortunately this is an evolution of technology really it's taking conventional social things and just making them 3d effectively um, but in doing so, it also gives us new tools that help us in those situations too. So I think that's the the lens that I look through that for, I guess. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to add to that one? No? Okay. Uh, Josh, sh should you blur digital and virtual spaces with reality? I think you can answer that, but do you want to answer it again? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like I say, it makes you so much more comfortable, comfortable and co uh, like uh what I said com comfortable and confidence God, yeah, that's, that's right yeah you did in the space um you know it, it just means that you can have you know when it's when the digital objects are then physically aware of your environment you can have physics-based interactions mm -hmm. you can then bring you know digital objects you can bring avatars or whatever into that space so you can have um you know virtual um sports you can have virtual concerts in your living room from your favorite artists mm -hmm. and then you can still engage with stuff in the physical space so you know you might be cooking scrambled egg and you want the menu up or you might be watching formula one and you want all the stats up as well mm -hmm. right so you it's not just constrained to screens now it's you can have all of that information in the in the virtual world and i think that is where it would eventually go you know i think like i said before vr is just a stepping stone mm -hmm. for, for entertainment but for our day-to-day -day lives that we spoke about the glasses mm -hmm. that is where it's going to uh you know be mass mass adoption in the future where we can all see relevant information you know we might meet somebody you can't remember their name and it googles their linkedin and it pops up in the on the head right you know that's that type of stuff which <laughs> sounds crazy and futuristic but you know why is it not possible you better hope there's no dirt on you on the internet then yeah, I know. no one will ever speak to you ever again <laughs> but yeah think I, I think popularity I points I still spaces yeah yeah black mirror yeah. <laughs> yeah. sometimes you kind of think is it a mistake doing this <laughs> You do wonder because you can, everyone's just kind of running forward really fast with the technology, but yeah, if you break it and it's too late once it's broken, isn't it? <laughs> what do you do then? <laughs> and I guess that, that leads on to one of Robbie's questions here. How long until we spend more time in the metaverse or in a metaverse-like environment than we do out of the metaverse environment and in the real world? I'd say we probably already do. When you think about the amount of time we're engaged with the internet, versus the time we're not in our lives now. It's practically when we're asleep, we're not engaged. And that's it. And, and you know, that's it really. And from my view, I think, you know, we can all choose how much we engage with that and when we choose to zone out from it and things like that. But um, but that's our world now. We're, you know, we're actually educated down the avenue of relying on the internet and its data provision and stuff like that. It's, it's practically a utility for us. Uh, I think that will only remain. And what kind of effect do you think AI is going to have in all of this kind of technological revolution in terms of the immersive space have you got any any comments? yeah I mean, I'm, I'm definitely watching that space very closely I, I see ai as being a bit like the influence that the industrial revolution had let's say so at the moment when you think about creators in the past before the industrial revolution there was lots of people making lots of things in their you know terraced house or whatever you know weaving wool and cotton and whatever it would be mm -hmm. then all of a sudden big machines came along and you know everyone was like hang on some people rebelled against that it's kind of like it's taking our jobs but actually it's not it's reinventing the way we work it's saying well actually you know what if we can get something and let's consider ai to be a new machine mm -hmm. that can actually assist us and take away some of the more mundane stuff that we have to do as human beings it frees up our opportunities to do other things you know when we move on as a society and say you know you know we look back and we don't really miss the days of having to sit there in our basements you know weaving cotton mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's like we move on and we can be creative and we can do more and this space is just tools that support us and take us to a next level of opportunity mm -hmm. 
So you've got chat GPT um, doing your your C sharp programming in Unity instead of you having to learn it. That sounds all right to me. <laughs> but typically, what it does, it does a utility level of it. You see, so you might ask it to do the stuff that's easy to explain to it, but it leaves you the opportunity to do the clever stuff that weaves it together. Yeah. You know, it's never going to answer those things. It's based on what people have done in the past at scale. Mm -hmm. So basically, if anything's been done loads, it's good at. Yeah. You know, which means that leaves us as human beings to move forward and pioneer instead, which we're good at. So, you know, nice balance. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good to me. <laughs> I've seen an interesting point raised where there's a question of what happens once we become so dependent on the likes of chat GPT that we're not actually creating the content anymore for it to consume, to then mm -hmm. assess, to then feed us back and yeah. how, how to maintain that loop. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's the, that is the key thing. And what happens there is that what we see now in other trades in terms of artisan where there'll always be the space for this artisan level which is very much human in the loop uh creativity that's exactly what it'll do it'll amplify that just as it has done in many other fields you know the fact that now you think if i want to buy a chair i can go to numerous shops to buy an engineered chair out of a factory but you know what i can still go to a carpenter and ask him to make something very specific mm -hmm. and i think that's the thing it's kind of like it's the difference between mass market propositions and tailored propositions and and you know and again the AI won't do the tailored thing as well as human beings will do. I'm convinced of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly won't be unique. And I think now, you know, there's a real precedence now on, on labeling things, whether it's AI generated or AI input or whether it's not. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's, a, I think that is the honesty and the, the kind of understanding up front is, is a big factor in that really more than actually the inclusion of AI to support the development of things in the first place. And I think there's a big, um, new thing when you look at web three and you know the attribution that creatives are now able to put into their work for example and you think about chat gpt type technology sat on top of that world mm -hmm. where actually every single thing every decision it ever makes and everything it ever presents to you is completely traceable back to exactly what contribution of any artist did anything mm -hmm. it effectively probably limits its ability to function mm -hmm. because what you'd find is the level of royalties you would have on any image and the complexity of that could be phenomenal and uh and the traceability of saying that you breach someone's copyright or you know you're involved with someone's copyright becomes a hugely complex thing but it's fundamentally 100 percent traceable mm -hmm. so i think that in itself creates an interesting impact of that again things like chat gpt and all the rest of these things are based on the fact that we've had very centralized systems for a very long time with free access to our data on a massive wide range of things and we're changing that world now that's the thing that's starting to alter people who are less likely to give that data into those systems mm -hmm. so it'd be interesting to see how that future evolves too yeah, that's a really good interesting point actually mm. yeah it's um, definitely something we need to uh figure out you know how we then attribute and mm -hmm. you know, pay people for for what they've contributed to to that database or what you've used of that database mm -hmm. It's, yeah. uh, Do you very... think there's any scope for blockchain in that, in terms of understanding, fragmenting, understanding, and having some sort of tagging or? Way I think that's where a lot of this attribution comes in. That's the promise of that kind of world. Mm -hmm. And but I think fundamentally as well, what that will also mean is no doubt the people that make the tools that those creatives use will also want attribution. They might say, just as at the moment we see publishing things on platforms, maybe they take a thirty percent fee on the publication end what we'll see is it'll just turn it on its head and say the people who make the tools will take the first 30 percent that we'll sit on top of you know because it's all again it's very clearly attributable so mm -hmm. be an interesting world um but i'm sure the same things will come around again just at different parts of the of the pipeline i see a lot of lawsuits coming yeah, yeah. yeah i was about For to sure. say that the lawyers are going to make a lot of money aren't they <laughs> yeah i mean because you know when i was in law school 300 years ago you know i i had trade copyright class and things like this and you know almost everything we read in our book back then in our cases were like nintendo you know versus so you know or apple versus ibm and things like that and and now you're going to be getting all the create you know the creative people in the mix too and things like that and so i i actually see huge amounts of litigation coming I think it depends how unless much. because well everyone's going to want their share right their percentage and then they're going to be arguing over well this wouldn't have gotten to here without me so therefore i've actually entitled to some of their percentage too you know it would be interesting 
I think it depends how much you've got in your bank account to fight things, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it up to or just ask ChatGPT to do it for you. Again, right? again, Simon. Just ask Chat GPT to do it for you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> okay, I'm just conscious of time. I'm, I'm going to ask maybe one more question, and then I'm going to introduce Samantha just so that you're aware of a, a bit of a background of her uh, before we wrap up. If that's okay, um, well, let's see what we've got. Well, Robbie's been on fire again. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, Simon, what impact will having rules to the stories have an audience engagement? Hmm. I think there's always rules to stories uh, wherever you go. You know, if you go to an immersive theatre, if you play on a certain platform, all the rest of it. So we're already in that world. Um, and I think that the rules are a good thing. Um, you know, we need to constrain things in certain ways anyway for, you know, first of all, making things accessible and also giving us some indication of what we're going to get. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's, it's like simple things about when they start putting age ratings on videos and all the rest of it and other content, it's like before you had that, you think, you know, you don't want to find out halfway through a movie that it's something that you didn't really want your kids to see or whatever, you know what I mean? So, so I think the rules are a very good thing. We're very used to that. We're very good at working within that. And it actually helps us as a consumer of those stories, understand the rules of engagement and the expectations, which helps us with our selections. So I think, I think it's always a good thing. Mm -hmm. And this one, this one's for you, Richard, and it's, it's less techy, but more from a perspective of uh, understanding how business works. Um, is it difficult to get clients when you can't share the extent of your involvement in projects due to loads of NDAs? Ooh. <laughs> um, well, obviously, it does make it harder to to advertise yourself. So in, in some ways, yeah, um, I mean, ultimately, a lot of our work has really come through like word of mouth and like Pete, uh, like we're working with the same clients so so th there is that element of it so it's you know it's you yeah it's that that <laughs> building of, of of trust to um to to get a new client yeah it's a difficult difficult one to to answer mm -hmm. i'd say you'd have to kill us if you told us <laughs> <laughs> No, that's fair enough. And I think you're right, you know, it's quite a small world. Um, I think the gaming world and the, the technology world and, you know, once you start building up reputation and credibility and you have your regular clients and, you know, partners that you work with, then then people just trust that you're going to be able to do the job, I guess, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much, guys. And thank you uh, to our audience for your fantastic questions again. And sorry, I didn't manage to answer. I've, I've got five open ones, but we have answered seven. So we've done not too badly. Um, so I'm just going to mention a little bit about Samantha, because I do urge you, um, although we can't fit it into the session now, um, Samantha has gone to the effort to, to do our 15 minute presentation for us. And I, I'm going to put that up on the um, the northerndigifest.co.uk website about an hour after today's session at the same time as I put this one up. Um, so please do go and check that out because it's really interesting and it's her sort of first person perspective as a VR um, pr like producer but also as a, a child of um, or a, of a, an alcoholic mum and her first hand experiences and how she's dealt with her grief um, in terms of producing this uh, VR experience to try and really share how, how she felt um, and how she's processed that. So it's a really powerful um, conversation, that she, a presentation, and I do urge you to go and have a look at it. So Samantha, I met at the Aesthetica Short Film Festival in the VR uh, soiree sort of um, area in the basement bar in York, and I just was really sort of you know, pleasantly surprised that she was there and thought she was doing some really interesting stuff. Um, she's the co-founder and CEO of a company called Virtual Umbrella, which is a marketing consultancy and it specializes in immersive technology. Um, in 2022, Samantha premiered her 360 film Anonymous at the Raindance Film Festival uh, and shared her story on the TEDx stage. Uh, she's also a community champion for Alcohol Change UK which is an organization that raises awareness about the dangers of alcohol. So please do go and check out Samantha's talk uh, at the end. Um, as I say, I'll get it up there as soon as I can straight after this session. So it should be up in about an hour's time. So we've run out of time. It's, it's 13, 29 and I have been trying to keep a tight ship so that guys, um, you know, you, you're not, you get your lunch basically. <laughs> so I'd like to say a massive thank you to you all. You know, like the presentations were fantastic, you know, really top notch, really inspiring. Um, my head's full again, and, and which is great. Uh, and, you know, some really exciting things on the horizon there that, that, that it's really great to know about and, and to discuss. So thank you very much for your time um, presenting. I just want to throw in a couple of uh, things for, you know, people might be online as well as a few opportunities one at media city in manchester they run a whole load of boot camps if you're interested in getting into this field 
whether that's game development or immersive technology or anything like that on the creative side and things like they do a whole load of boot camps if you look up skillcity.com uh, you'll find them all on there so they do a lot of that and again that's national so it doesn't matter where you live it's all remote but you know again something that's very northern based as well so great for all of us a lot and the other thing is if anyone's looking for someone to do some prototypes in this field then i think uh olive uh, ketteridge is actually on this thing now and uh she's a great producer of immersive content and things like that so reach out to her and she can make your prototype or whatever it would be but she's really skilled at the whole immersive space as well so just a couple yeah. of shows and she's just started her own business so she's open for business exactly. as a self-employed person so yeah please That's do it. reach out definitely thank you for that and thanks for the shout out to, like, to olive okay and thank you to you guys i uh, really appreciate your time today uh, and your input and as i say uh, thanks again to our sponsors sign the screen industries growth network uh, this presentation and, and talk will be up online northerndigifest.co.uk please share it with your friends and family uh, and far and wide uh, so that we can we can spread the love as far as we can uh, and everyone can get the benefit so yeah that's me thank you very much and uh, thanks very much guys. Appreciate it. Thank you very much bye. thank you bye bye bye